we are going to do something like quite classical saying identity, globalization, and why I'm talking about territorialized you know, identities in this globalized world and what are the consequences. First about identity. When people talk about identity, I, I think sometimes they don't get really the point because they talk about identity and they, talk, they think it's about singularity, what you really are inside yourself, so different from others. But identity first, you know, in mathematics, for instance, is the fact that being identical is exactly the opposite, actually, which is weird. So your identity is not how you are, what you are really deep inside yourself. It's first to whom you want to resemble, to who you want to look like. And it's like if in human beings, human beings need identity. That means that they need to feel that they look like someone else, sometimes a hero. You know, that's the reason why in religion, mythology is full of heroes and things like that. And so you identify. But now even in, nowadays in TV and all that, it's to identify. To identify is to look like. And when we feel we look like someone, like someone like could be a mythological personality or something. In the same time, we feel that we are really ourselves, which is really weird. Because we can talk about ourselves like if we were someone else. Human beings are like that. They can't stand the fact that they are flesh and bones, and at least only that. They need to identify, so that means, I could say, identity is about the narrative structure of your being. So you talk about yourself to say what you are. So you talk about yourself with the way you dress. I mean, we are the only animals to not to have techniques, because animals, they have technology. But our technology is so weird that it is a way of so to say what we are. It's not only to not be cold or something. It's just, yeah, I'm going to say what I am. For instance, I don't know, I'm dressing and such. I mean, if I was, if I was teaching law and not philosophy, maybe I will have a tie because I want to say what I am in such a way. Identity is about that. It's kind of identification to what I'm supposed to be outside of that. So that's the first level of identity. Like narratives and theater second level, because I have to show, it's not only a narrative I talk to myself, tell myself, I need to show people what I am. So I reflect to people and I, so I'm like in a scenario. And if people don't accept my scenario, meaning the way I'm dressed, you know, and they look at me and they despise me, for instance, I'm supposed to be a philosopher because I'm here, I was invited here, so I'm talking. And some people, I saw sometimes that with my students and I just hate that, and they will say like that, you will say, hmm, when I'm saying something, it's just like, yes, talk, you know. Say, hmm, yeah, wait, what he's saying, he's just that, you know. And so, it could be even worse because they'll say, <sighs> It's like, he's not even a philosopher. <laughs> Who is this guy? And at this time, that means my identity, being as a philosopher, what I projected, the way I'm dressed, the way I'm talking, is not accepted. So the scenario is not accepted by the people that are around. And if the scenario is not accepted, it could reach to such a point that I feel humiliated. It's what Pierre Bourdieu called symbolic violence that is everywhere in our society. In my definition of symbolic violence, it's when your identity is broken by someone, somebody that is laughing at you or not considering you the way you would like to be considered. You know? For instance, in the, in the Me Too mo social movement, in my opinion, what is really deep in the Me Too social movement, not only what, you see, what we see in the media and those things and oh, uh, what is actually happening, you know, it's also the fact that there is something about what is a woman and what is woman identity in these things, narratives? Like, do you recognize what they actually are telling about themselves, what they want to be? You know? So that's the first thing about identity. It's very important. It's what I called the third level, which is in fact the deepest one of human desire. The first level, we share it with animals, like the desire to survive. The second level is the desire, what I call the desire to be, which will be uh, to survive better, like comfort, things like that, you know? And the third level is what I call the desire to be. And the desire to be is directly related to the desire to become. To become. 
And the desire to become is the desire to become and to become even more and more. And this extension at the end of the day is like, I will love to be forever. That's the, the point of religion and all that. That's the reason why identity is also re related to religion. So identity. Now, globalization. What is globalization? People talk all the time about globalization. It's, you know, uh, it's about economy and exchange now all over the world. I think globalization is that, of course. But it's very peripheral. peripheral. The first thing about globalization, in my opinion, the first thing is the global, meaning on the globe, global, just the fact that the Earth as a whole, the global circulation of desire, but of desire to be, which is the third level of desire, which is actually identity, if you have understood what I said on the first time, on the first moment of my talk. right? So that's the circulation of the desire to be on a global scale, not even circulation in a way. Not even circulation, because you know, when you, what is, for instance, New York identity or national identity or family identity is because it's when you are talking with people, so you are exchanging symbols. And the way you are exchanging symbols on a certain circle, you are making your own scenario, what you want to be in this family. You're supposed to be the smart one. You're supposed to be the, the joker. You are supposed to be the funny one, you are supposed to be the ironic one, you are supposed to be no one and you feel bad about it, you know? And you have your, some kind of a room in the scenario, it's your identity in the family, it's your identity in the, in the, in the block, in the city, it's your identity in New York City, it's your identity as an American, etc., etc., etc. So it depends on the capacity to exchange those symbols, those informations in real time. Before we didn't have a global identity, because we couldn't exchange symbol in real time in very in very speedy, you know. But now with internet, it's like if we had a global circulations of symbols. Doesn't mean that we are losing what we are here in New York City, what we are here in our family. That means there are some kind of uh, hybridations of our desire to be, you know. And so those hybridation, they create something new. And this time, it's something quite weird. Because on a globalized world, because this globalized world is made not on specific territories, as I said before, you saw, when I wanted to talk to you about those identity perimeters, at first I said family, it's a certain perimeter, people you meet every day, in real time, on a certain space, which would be your house, part of the city, or in the city, so the city is a space, it's geographically, you know, it's located geographically. And after you have uh, the United States of America, there are borders, we know about that now with your president. We know there are borders in the United States of America. Yes, you know, we can't forget about it, especially when we are foreigner. I mean, I arrived yesterday and I, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I knew there was borders, you know, especially when I was in the back office and I was asked so many questions about why do you come over here and just, you know. So we have borders, so it's territory, geographical. But when I talked about the last one, the globalized one, it's not only a question of perimeter, which is weird compared to the other one. So it's not only a change in uh, the perimeter of what our identities, which was before different perimeters, bigger and bigger and bigger time after time. But now there is a change of the nature, the very nature of identity. Because those identity, they are not rooted anymore, this last level, in a specific perimeter, geographic perimeter which is really weird. So that has some consequences of what is identity and what will happen with it. Because I told you identity is about desire, the desire to live together, to share symbols, and to feel in this theater that life is worth it. Because you feel good telling about yourself that you're strong and you're that and that and that, and you need to have reaction of people on your, the scale. But now it's on a global scale that that is happening. You know? And so it's when, it's where happen what I call territoryless identities. Territoryless identities are 
space of desire, what I call space of desires, that are not rooted specifically on a territory. And they have impact on territories because we are still living on the earth. So we are still living on territories like on the ground. For instance, I give you an example, like some kind of a positive territorialist identity, and after I give you an example of uh, what I call negative territorialist identity that have consequences, for instance, it's new jihadism. But let's talk about positive territorialist identities. We will have a manga culture. You know manga, like it's supposed to come from Japan, but in fact it doesn't it's not Japanese anymore. First, you will have symbol from everywhere. You'll have uh, a girl that is dressed uh, like, like in a, a British board, boarding school. And you will have other kind of symbols, Celtic symbols, European symbols, and you'll have African symbols, everything mixed up all together with the idea that even Japanese culture will become part of Japanese culture, will become territorialized, kind of a territorialized identity through through uh, manga cultures. And so you'll have all the features of what is an identity. So that means people, they will exchange symbols, dressing in certain way, when they are manga, uh, you know, aficionados. And they will like certain kind of food. It will even transform their taste, their way of living, even their political uh, ideas, because politics is first about style. People say politics is about ideas and all that. But ideas comes after, <laughs> much after. People, they pretend they are left wing because they feel so good to feel that they are left wing and they dress like left wing and they look at each other and look at others. And after ideology comes really very far after. So that's the reason why when you are in a conversation with your friends, you try to convince them, they don't give a damn about it. And if they pretend they are convinced just three minutes after, it doesn't change anything because it's an aesthetic, it's a style. And so to get into the style and to, into the identity, into their scenario, that's much, much, much deeper and more difficult than just convincing someone. You know? So uh, you have those territory less positive identity so people are recognizing themselves through that and they are playing they are acting they have they have the uh, some kind of heroes they identify with they meet with each other but on this global scale so what is really weird with that is that identity is also a way to feel that you are close to somebody, close to somebody because you share somehow part of his identity and usually it's worked with the part of the city, the village or the city itself or the country and all that. But now that you have that, you will have people that will feel that they are closer to someone, for instance, they live here in New York City, and they will feel closer to someone that is living in Japan or someone that is living in Brazil and share the same territorialist identity. And they will feel that really they understand each other. They are, desire each other, even sexually. They desire to leave something with each other, you know? But on the other way, they will be feel far, sometimes far away from someone that lives in the same building and someone that lives in the same part of the city. And that makes things being really complex because in another way, they also share things with people that live in the same building. And at least they have to because they have to deal with some kind of conflicts in the same building, you know? But they will be far in a way. So that was, that was one of the first effects of those territorialist identities. So when people say, there is a clash of civilizations, I say, no, of course not. And I wrote a book that is called, there is no such a thing like clash of civilization or something like that. And, and the journalists, they always say, they always say, oh, you're so positive, so optimistic. So I'm not optimistic. I think it's much worse, <laughs> much, much worse. Because at least when there was what we call civilization, there will be borders, and you know where is the enemy, the people that you don't like. But now, it's everywhere people that you like more than the people that actually live in the same building. That's really a problem to deal with in our society now. Because aside from 
positive territorialist identities, you have what I could call negative territorialist identities. Because as I told you, to build an identity, identity is built out of the circulation of desires. And, I, and when desire now are circulating on a global scale, it's also frustrations that is circulating on a global scale, because it's desire, and desire is what? Images, narratives, people on Facebook that say what they are doing today. So they live in New York City, they're saying, oh, today I'm doing such a nice thing, so I'm going to concert and do that, and yes, life is so great. And you have people in sub-Saharan Africa, that is also on Facebook, say, oh, those guys are doing that, as such, like, desire frustrations, images, they feel that in a way, it's like if they were really close to those people living in New York City, but it's like if they couldn't reach it, couldn't really live it, because they don't have, they don't have the money, not only the money, the environment is not exactly the same, you know? And so they feel what is actually happening. And it makes, I don't know how I can translate that into English, but in French, the expression, the concept I, I choose is, um, I said it's uh, um, vitrine, I don't know how I could say, what? Window. window, but I mean window in a shop or something. And I said it's a global window effect, I call it. I call it like, you are close because you are just here, but it's just like, shit, I don't, I don't grab it. So what do you want to do when that happens? You want to break the window, you know? You know, exactly, resentment, exactly that. You want to break the window. And so this effect is what I call global negative territorialist identities. And what happens is actually Daesh, ISIS, what we call ISIS, you know, is some kind of a new organization, we could say even some kind of a company, a business, that decided that has the genius to take advantage of this, you know, of this global frustration. Like a company that will take shares of this global frustration. But because it's territory-less, that means you don't need organizations that are rooted into a specific place. But you just need people that are here in the same building. But it's not manga for them. They go into internet and they feel humiliated because the scenario that have actually built, remember what I said about what is identity, is not recognized. So they feel people look at them, look down at them in a certain way. Could be true or could be only subjective. Sometimes it's both, feeding the different levels, and at one point, they feel they are not playing in a scenario they would like to play, you know, so they feel weak and all that, and you have people on the internet that say, in fact, and in psychology, what they call the reverse of, uh, you know, the, the negative identification process of, of discriminative, auto-discriminative process, that means that uh, you feel that you don't succeed in anything, that, every, that you're a failure in your life, that nothing's working and all that. And you have somebody that tells you, in fact, if you fail here, if it doesn't work there, if you don't have success with girls, and if you don't have money, etc., it's not because you're a failure. It's because this very society is too low for you. You are a hero. It's actually because you're a hero that you're a failure here because this society is really bad. And so it's changed completely the image of what you have. You're a hero. So this was a preparation of what you are supposed to be. It's not good enough for you. And that, that works with everybody when you're in such a situation because that's inside the human, I mean, an anthropolog at an anthropological level, when you are building your personality, when you are young, when you are a teenager, you want to be the first, you want to be the center of the world, you want life to be in front of you, like, you remember what I said? The desire to be is really related directly to the desire to become what you want to become. And when you feel you can't, and somebody tells you, it's because you are going to become much more than that. I mean, you buy it, of course. And so you don't need to have groups around you, so the cops and the police and all that, they can try to trace you and all that. 
But they can't because you're on your own. Not only on your own, because there are other people with whom you will be related through internet and other things. And you'll be ready to do anything. Because with human beings, with human beings you have the desire to survive, as like I said, the second level of desire to live and the desire to be. But the desire to be is first in human beings. So that means they are already human beings. When they feel humiliated, although they feel they could become a hero, they are ready to forget about the, first, the two first levels. That's the reason why with politics, when you have people are starving, the population is starving, if you have a religious government, they can make people feel that they can die for the cause because they die for the desire to be for the last structure that is actually first in the heart of what a human beings want to be. When there is a problem with the desire to be, it's what I call mythological depression. Because depression, what is the physical process of a depression is when you have, when the air is getting thin, 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 and the, the plane is falling, you know? And when we are playing, we are like on the scene of our life, like in a theater, Mythological depression is when the scenario is just crumbling and And so you are ready to enter any scenario. It's true with, let's say, it's true with Daesh, ISIS. But it's also true sometimes on a national level, on the national scale. It's what is called populism. I mean, for me, the other name will be Donald Trump. Because that means it's the, there is a mythological depression all over America in this desire to be, the desire to become, so let's America great again. It's interesting because it's a real depression because it's the first time, as far as I know, in history of American politics that the president is elected with the idea that America has to become great again, meaning it's not anymore. While the others, even though they were really right-wing, they will say, yes, let's America being great, like it is great, so it will become greater or something. But the fact that it is said in this country that let's America great again, it looks like some kind of mythological, for me, I'm not specialist, but mythological depression. So you see, what I wanted to say about territory-less identities, that means that we are in a world where People will be with each other. We feel good with each other in a way they didn't before, with groups that will constrict each other in a way they didn't before, but in the same time will occur new kind of violence in a way it didn't before. And we are not prepared to that. Thank you.